starting with Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that fell it, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy, mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet open, as long as the first section is still standing, which is the symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body, imposed until the time of reformation. So when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify the for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish, to God, purifying our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves give better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered, not into, only, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have to suffer rep repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting him.
Thank you, Scott. Lord, we thank you for your words that we get to read them. And we see just the, the anticipatory tension that we, we come into in Easter, but that we on, on, on this side of, of your resurrection understand and get to partake in, Lord. And so we pray that we receive this and that we would give this. And that these words would inform our lives, that we would go out and proclaim your glory to the world around us. Amen. All right. Lord, we thank you for these kids. We thank you for Oliver and for, for Finn and for Elsie and Willa and David and Joshua and Truett and Ellis and Meredith and Morgan and Wyatt and Judah and Margaret and Duncan and Finn and Claire and Johan and Izzy, for Ava, for Lily, all the rest of the kids that went back whose names I miss, Lord, we know that, that you know their names and you know every hair on their head. And so we pray that we would be uh, a faithful church that we would continue to be discipled by you that we would disciple others and that all would know and understand who you are amen hebrews nine i just love the as we come into to eight starting at verse 13 and speaking of the new company makes the first one obsolete and by becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away and so it can be it can be easy at, at that moment right to we say man it's vanished away and, and like we get to kind of go about and, and do and, and live life in, in freedom and kind of as we want to right and so there's this like did anybody else leave last, if you were here last week or if you've read that before? I mean, does that kind of lift your spirits and make you a little bit lighter on the feet? Like, you just to think about the, the system and, the, and the, you're living in this, this, this way of being where we think, okay, I've got to get, you know, everything all squared away. A plus B has to equal C, and if C doesn't, then everything falls apart. And then the Lord comes in, he's like, oh, actually, uh, I took down the curtain and that old system that you put up and that you tried to live in and it didn't work. Yeah, that, that is vanished. It is gone. Yeah, all right, like, let's get pumped about that. And then, the, right, he turns around, the author writes to us, and says, now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. And he goes in these, they go into this detail about, about the tent. It's like, man, why, why, why are we getting back into these details? Why are, we, why are we going on and on about this stuff? And then, and then what's this thing about, in, in, in verse 7, it says, But into the second, only the high priest goes, and once a year, without taking blood, which he offers himself for the unintentional sins of the people. And so all of a sudden, like, you feel like you, you it's like you, you, you took your coat off, and you put your coat back on. You took, you know, like, the, the backpack off, and then you put the backpack back on. And all of a sudden, it's like, man, you, you're just like, well, I thought we were done with that. Why are, we, why are we talking about this? Let's talk a little bit about it. Because there's some really beautiful things here. That's why. And there's some stuff that we forget and that we don't quite understand and we don't recognize in our context because has anybody ever, I mean, I've never, I've actually never been into like even a replica of, of a tabernacle. I've seen like the pictures. Anybody else spent much time like in that tent in the desert? Okay, I got a picture for it because, all right, so um, yeah, total, as you can see, totally jacked this image online. This was not something that, that I, uh, um, I took, right? And so here's the tabernacle. So you see there's kind of this two-phase thing. And so if you look, it's, it's twice as, as long as it is wide, um, similar to a Olympic hockey rink. Never mind. Um, and, and so what it was, is, and, and, and there's a bunch of symbolism. And there's things that, that we don't necessarily recognize that, that are really important to see here. And so you know what else is, is twice as, as maybe tall as it is wide if you're looking at it uh, from an aerial view? The promised land. 
So every time you went into the tabernacle, you're remembering that, that what we just celebrated, right? That the Lord had, had taken you out of slavery in Egypt and he was going to bring you to a promised land. So every time you went into the tabernacle, you remember, I'm bound for the promised land. Also, it's, um, it's expandable. And so if, if you look and you can see that, that that white curtain that goes all the way around, it doesn't quite touch the, the ground. Okay, it's, it's tethered on, on all those poles, but it doesn't quite touch the ground. And it was to help the people to remember that, that there was a barrier, but that, that the Lord was, was bringing heaven and earth back together again. That there had been a fracture, but the Lord is bringing it back together again. So every time you walked back in, you, you were part of this thing that was, that was temporary, but was supposed to become permanent. And that it was the Lord's doing, the Lord is bringing heaven and earth back together again. And then the way that this was set up was it was, it was supposed to be expandable, to become permanent, much like who? The kingdom of God, right? The, the kingdom of priests that Israel was set apart to be. So you'd be ever, ever growing, ever expanding, but always permanent. And so when, and then we, so you'd go, you'd enter in there, but um, now could you just walk, like, like if you come onto my, like if, if that were my yard, right, like you could come onto my yard, uh, certain people can come onto my yard, and, and that's fine. I expect certain people to come, many of you have come onto my yard, and I'm not surprised when you show up. Whether you've called the head or not, I'm like, oh, this person is here, neat. The other morning, somebody was doing utility work in, in our backyard at 2 o'clock in the morning. And they had not called or, or asked permission. I was very confused. And, and th it was weird, right? And, and so, like, can anybody just walk into things, right? Or is there some sort of a relationship that needs to be established? There's a type of relationship, right? And so not everybody, if you, 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 you ever could come into that, that first court there, but not everybody could go into that tent, right? It's like, can I just walk over and like come into your house? No, right? Like I should, I should maybe call ahead. I should probably stop at the threshold and knock and ask permission. Now there's some people, right? Like, like there, there are certain people in my life, they actually have a key. They're just like, hey, yeah, you just like come over, right? Like Sean doesn't really need to knock. Yeah, he just, hey, hey, you know, like it's usually just kind of a courtesy tap, like, hey, just, you know, make sure you're, okay, all right, I'm coming in, right? Why? Well, because I've been knowing Sean for a long, long time. So there's an established relationship there. And so much this way was, was you could come in and, and, and you get to that, that curtain. And so there was awareness of the presence of God was in that tent. But you, you could only get so far. So it was, it was this weird like, hey, the Lord's like, I'm, I'm here, but you can't quite experience it. There's still a curtain there. But certain people could get behind that curtain. The priests and Levites, they'd go behind that curtain. And if you walked in there, you'd see blue and gold and there'd be like, Almonds, which is like symbol for remembrance. There'd be flowers to help you remember the, the garden and the way that we used to walk with the Lord. And so it was both like this reminder of what we'd lost, but this guarantee and this promise of what was to come. So every time you went in there, you, you remembered what had been lost, but you also remembered the promise of God of what was before you, what was on the table was offered. And then speaking of the table, you'd look off to one side and there'd be a table and it would have 12 loaves of bread on there for the 12 tribes of Israel, Israel the 12 months out of the year. And every single week, new bread. I really like the way that fresh baked bread smells. So every time you'd walk into this tent, right, you'd have, there'd be, there'd be bread. And you get to feast on that bread. But now, anybody ever, like, left bread out on the counter? What happens to bread after about a week? You either, it, it either becomes kind of a crouton, or you got to give it a shave, right? But either way, not fit for consumption anymore. Okay, and, and so every, but this is the great thing about the Lord, right? The Lord's like, I, I get that. I'm not, you're not showing up to my house and having moldy bread and croutons. So each and every week, new and fresh bread. So every time you showed up, like when we have communion, 
right? We celebrate, and, and so like meals in the ancient Near East were really important. We've talked about this in the past because they didn't have uh, pr- systems of protection the way that we have systems of protection today. So if, if you were to sit down and have a meal with somebody, that meant that like you were with them. You were gonna, you were, w- you're gonna protect them. You're gonna help. You're gonna guide them. You were with them. If someone were to come and and to to try to like do something bad to them, they had to get through you and yours first. And so every time you sat down with the priest and you ate that bread, you learned and understood more about who God was and the way that the Lord protected His people and guided His people into a holistic relationship. And so then th- you would look on the other side, and then there would be this this lamp. And and and. And it was, it was, they, were, yeah, they used pure olive oil for this lamp. And so the lamp never went out, right? Motel 6, totally hijacked it from this. Like, we will leave the light on for you. The light was to be perpetually burning so that whenever you felt that you needed atonement, whenever you, you were not sure about your relationship with the Lord, whenever you were not sure about what was going on in life, you could go and you could meet with a priest and the priest would be there because they were always there trimming the wicks and making sure and tending to that flame. So that flame never went out. So you got this perpetually burning flame. You got bread that never runs out. And then you would you'd go through that. So as we, let's just get back in the text. So if a tent was prepared, the first section was a lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. And it was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section. Okay, so now priests and Levites, they could be in there. You could go in there when the, when the Levites brought you in, kind of like the tour guide or whatever else. And then, but then there was this other curtain. And only one person could go into that second place. Only one person could go to phase two, and they could only go one time a year. And that was on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And so there was this meal, and it was not a feast. Throughout the book of Leviticus, we see a lot of feasts. Like, if, if you want to get an idea of, like, how to barbecue and, like, how to do a summertime, like, gala, read the book of Leviticus. Because the book of Leviticus, as, as kind of boring as it sometimes can be, it is a book on how to party. It is a book on how to have a feast. It is a book about how to love people well through food and how to celebrate deeply. This was not a day of celebration. This was a day of fear. This was a day of uncertainty. This was a day where you went, man, we hope that for the last year that we did it right. We hope that that what we've done, that the sacrifices that we've offered, we hope that it's enough. We we followed it along, and and man, we we just really hope that that the goat that we brought, that the bull that we have, the ram that was here, the sheep that we had, the doves, we we hope they were good enough. And so the the high priest would go in and he would offer these these sacrifices for the sins of the people in the, the second part of that room. Imagine being a high priest. And this is like the day, right? You got, a, you got a special set of clothes that you only wear on this day. And, and, and they, they were passed down from you, from the high priest before you and the one before them and before them and before them and before them. And, and you would pass it on to the ones after you and after them and after them. And so it was just a high day. But can you imagine like walking in to that tent? Like, Anybody like, does, does like anybody performance driven? Anybody like you feel like you need to perform to, to feel good and to feel right? Anybody like your world is off if you haven't checked the boxes? Okay, imagine, imagine the, the stress and the pressure that, that you live in now. Like now you are now responsible for the nation of Israel and their sins. And, and now, like, what's the checklist that you're going through as you walk up to that curtain? You're going like, uh, like, you're looking out. They're looking at you. You're looking back at them. And you're like, okay. I, I, you say the prayer. You're like, all right, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. And you, they tie the rope around so that if you fell over dead, they could pull you back out without going into the presence of God. So you turn, and you're just thinking like, okay, was I kind? Did I walk with the Lord? Did I remember to repent of all the sins? You're looking at, at the bull. You're like, okay, buddy. Are you totally? Yeah, oh, is that? Oh, no, that's just a bug. Okay, that's fine. All right, here we go. And you go behind the curtain. I mean, would that, like, do you feel that trepidation, that fear? Then you, you go into that curtain and having the, the golden altar, the incense, and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides 
with gold, in which a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing, so literally casting a shadow, their wings casting a shadow on the mercy seat. These things, and so these things we can't speak in detail. He's like, yeah, we, we just got to go on these. And so he's, the author is giving us these, these, these highlights to help us to understand what's going on here. So it, the, the high priest would peel back the curtain, he'd go in, and there would be the ark. The ark is exactly a tenth the dimensions of the tabernacle. So that's kind of a fun thing. We see this ever scaling, ever going out um, image. It's, it's shown throughout the tabernacle. And inside, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant is like a, a memory box. You ever have a memory box growing up? I think I was like 10. I got this thing. Michael's stuff. And I would put stuff in here when I went places. And uh, and now it's just kind of a, a random hodgepodge of things that, that, I, that aren't like of great value, but I just can't seem to, to throw away. Um, my first motorcycle manual. I have YouTube, but I just, I like that. I got to go to the World Series, Colorado Rockies. That was kind of cool. I got this flag that my, my grandfather brought back. Um, got a Homer hanky my grandma gave me. Got some of my, my grandpa's kind of artifacts and, and different things um, from his, his military career. Got this pin that the Japanese baseball team was passing out. My brother and I were sitting there watching him practice, and this guy who I never knew his name, never, he just kind of walked up. And he's like, passed me through the fence, and we took off. I was like, that's cool. I like that. Probably one of the things I, I this is probably, so I, I was a big autograph hound, right? And uh, so on this baseball, I got a bunch of these baseballs that are just signed by all these people that never became anything. This is my favorite. Probably my, of all the autographs that I have, this one's my favorite. This is of Elaine Lewis. Has anyone ever heard of Elaine Lewis? Yeah, you'd have no reason to know who Elaine Lewis is, but she used to sit behind my grandma. She was a season ticket holder at the Twins, uh, the Twins baseball games. And you ever seen the movie A League of Their Own about the women's baseball team? Elaine Lewis was the catcher for the Detroit team, and that was super cool. And so I got to meet her, and I was a catcher. And uh, so I just chat, and I, I turn around, and I was like 10. I was like, I was like didn't know, like, the, the brevity and kind of the gravity of, of the situation that Elaine had lived through. And I was like, hey, Elaine, can I have your autograph? Like, you're a professional baseball player. Like, can I have your autograph? And she cried. Nobody had ever asked her for her autograph before. And so that is, like, one of my favorite things, right? And so that's why it goes into Michael's stuff box, because I'm like, oh, you know, and so this box, it just – you know, I should probably get, like get a safe from Jeff and whatever, because <laughs> that plastic is just gonna burn up if there's ever a fire. But um, so within within the ark, this is like God's stuff, and inside that ark, He's got this this staff that says like this is the, it, 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 it was gonna show the Lord's provision. And it was going to show the way the Lord was going to guide the people, the way that, that he would do things for them and with them and to them that no other God could. And that the, the promises that he had would be fulfilled by his power, not by the people's ability to perform. And then next to that, there would be the tablets. And so it would say, like, no longer would you have to guess about whether or not you were right or wrong, in or out, or what you were doing was the way to go. He's saying, I've, I've created a pathway for you to follow. No longer do you have to guess about your atonement. No longer do you have to guess about your position before me. The Lord says, this is how you're to live. This is who you are. We've talked about this. About Exodus 19 comes before Exodus 20. It says, Exodus 19, you are my treasured possession. Therefore, 10 commandments, do these things. Not do these things so that you can become my treasured possession. So every time that that priest would walk in, he would see the promises of the Lord. He would see the way the Lord has provided for the people. He would understand the path that the Lord has created to bring the people back into a relationship with him. Because if, if he didn't already get that by walking through the proportional gates and the curtains with the reminders and everything, he'd be there. And then where would he meet the Lord? 
It's always important. Where do we meet the Lord when we come to the Lord with our sins? Where do we meet him? The mercy seat. We meet the Lord with our sins at the mercy seat. And so when we go and, and, and the blood is there, and so at the mercy seat. And so when the psalmist writes about, I meet, I, I sing beneath the shadow of your wings, where do we meet between the shadow of his wings? At the mercy seat of God. That is where our sins go to die. So every single year, the high priest would walk back in there and he'd take the sins of the people, would go in, the sins of the entire nation would go in and they would meet with the Lord at the mercy seat. And so when the old way has gone away, as he remembers your sin no more, it's because he has met your sins at the mercy seat. This is the context. This is what the people are, are experiencing. But what's the problem with this? It's exhausting, right? It wears out after a while. This hat used to be brand new. This hat used to not swell, smell like sweat and work. This hat used to smell like department store. I bought this hat in Dickinson, North Dakota at Runnings Farm and Fleet because I needed a hat. And as a result, this hat went up and down a bunch of water towers with me. And as a result, this, this hat built a bunch of, uh, uh, of walls with me. And it went on a lot of runs with me. And as a result, it does not look fresh and brand new. This shirt was sent to me by my friend Duncan, who worked at a Triumph motorcycle dealership in Wales. It is soft. It is always soft. It is, I, I love this shirt a lot. And you can tell because the, the collar is wearing out. There's stains on here that will not come out. I've tried. These pants, I used to wear these pants on dates. I took Megan on dates in these pants. They were nice enough to wear on a date. They don't even have the bottoms anymore. My mother-in-law patched these three times until finally she's like, ah, it might be time for new pants. Because it wears out. These systems that we have, the bread needed to be refreshed. The oil needed to be refreshed. The blood of the bull needed to be refreshed. And so why all these preparations? Why all this going on? Verse 8, by this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet open as long as the first section is still standing. So he's saying that, that that gap that we see at the bottom of the curtain, that white curtain going around, that gap that we feel that is always going to be there as long as we put our hope in bulls and bread and burning candles. If your hope is not in the new covenant, if you're going to continue to, to remember your sins all the time, if you're going to continue to, to rebuild that which has vanished, then you are not going to get to share in the goodness of God. Because you're going to constantly try to set up these idols that Jesus has already taken down. So by this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet open. So the Holy Spirit brings us to holy places. We cannot get there ourselves. And so we start thinking, what is this? What, what is this? What is this doing? So we, there's still this smoke. So what is the point of all this? The author is going to tell us in verse 9, says, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. So you could do all the things on the outside, but what would happen? Eventually, the hat would wear out. The shirt would become tattered and would be, eventually become a rag. The jeans will just become another part of a bonfire. Because the Holy Spirit says, by the, by the, I'm going to bring you, I'm going to clear your conscience. This thing that, that is within you is, is going to be made clear. So the conscience was something, that was a, it was memory. It was, it was, the, uh, and it was there, the, the reason that, that the, the author writes about this is the point of, of the clear conscience is a way to increase the awareness uh, of, of who we are and, and what's going on in, in our sins. Not that we would continue to be burdened by them, but that it would cause us to move into the arms of loving God. The, the, the awareness of, of, our, of our sin, the awareness that the, the old system brought, wasn't there to burden us. 
It was there to, to, to get us to, to flee from sin and flee into the arms of the loving God. The, the, the Hebrews never thought about just running away from something, but always running to something, right? Like you, you see danger and you go, ah! and you just like run aimlessly through the woods. You see that in the movies. What happens? You trip on a stick, you break your ankle, and the bear gets you, okay? or, or whatever like scary thing. Like it happens all the time. The Israelite didn't just run aimlessly. They ran to the Father. As Andrew sung earlier, won by affections, bought by blood. They ran to the Father because they knew the character of the Father. This is, I mean, this is the, the whole setup of, of the tabernacle. What, what the author of Hebrews is, is trying to get the people that are, are waning, who are not really sure about who Jesus is, who are, who are fatiguing in their relationship with him. That he's saying, hey, look, don't run away aimlessly. Run to the Lord. This is the, if, if this earthly setup couldn't do it, why do you, he's got, the author is basically posing the question, why do you think that devoid of this system that couldn't quite do it, that you can somehow conjure up something better on your own? Unholy people don't get to go to the most holy place. The Holy Spirit brings the people to the holy places. So the good news, so the author is, is trying to get it, and we're going to dive headlong into this next week. He's saying, God's torn down the curtain. God has torn down the curtain and has invited us to walk with him. That tabernacle was a moving garden. So the, the moving garden, when you go in there, it looked like all the images, all the things that you'd see in the Garden of Eden, it was there. So it's to remind you of, of what had been lost and where you were going. And so when you go into that, and the, so it's, and, and what was the, the great part about the Garden of Eden? You got to walk with God. Everything else was a side benefit. Like all, I mean, like food that had never tasted erosion or soil depletion. Like, can you imagine what that tasted like? Like, Katie and I were talking about how much we love the new, the new Cosmic Crisp apple, apple. Like, the apples in the Garden of Eden would have been way better. But that wasn't the best part. The best part is that you were walking with God. And so what the author of Hebrews is trying to help the people to see is that God has torn down the curtain and invites us to walk with him. He's made the way for that to happen. So there's three things we need to see um, in this. And so, and, and, and so how, like, how does Jesus help us to see this? When you walk in and you look and you saw that light, we, if, if you were with us uh, last year when we went through John, John 9, 5, Jesus is the light of the world. All this is pointing to Christ. So you walk in, Jesus is the light of the world. John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. No longer do you have to refresh every single day. No longer do you have to hope that the t-shirt won't wear out. No longer do you have to, to wait in anticipation and, and try to consume before the bread gets fuzzy or rock hard. And then when you go in, no longer do you have to, to wait and offer a sacrifice every single day. No longer does the high priest need to go back in in the smoke-filled room to, to see through, these, uh, through, through the lenses vaguely because Jesus says, I'm the new temple. So no longer do the people have to look through a curtain. No longer does the high priest look through smoke. We get to stare the Lord face to face. And we get to see him clearly because Jesus is him and has revealed us who God the Father is. Three reasons this is important. One, we see the generosity, the giving nature of God. Everywhere we turn, we see these, these, these ways that he's given us to remember his goodness. If we look for them. So he's a giving God. And we see the glory in the shadows. So even in this not yet, we see God's presence. Even in this, this tent that was just there, the God, God's like, hey, I, you, you left home, but I'm going to send you with this tent that's going to remind you of all the things. And it's going to inform you about who you are, this ever-expanding, to be permanent, always growing ever-increasing nation of God. So we see the, the generosity of God, we see the glory of God, and then we see that God is a God. That he clears our conscience and gives us a clear sight line to him. 
And so if you wonder, man, I just can't, I can't get these things out of my head, then, then we, we turn our attention and, and increase our awareness of the presence of God. If we, do, we don't defeat sin through behavior modification. If we learn anything from the Hebrew Scriptures, that should teach us that. Yes, there are things that we may need to change in order to, for, you know, like there are behaviors that need to change, but it's our affections that change first. True transformation happens by the renewal of our mind and the change of our affections. And so we have a clear sight line to God that our affections are 100% tuned on him. And there's no more smoke. We remember that we are priests and that we're able to go out and be ambassadors to the world around us. Matthew Henry says this. He says, we have far greater advantages under the gospel than they, the priests, had under the law. And either we must be better or we shall be worse. We must be better or we shall be worse. We must understand that we, that John 16, we're convicted of our righteousness. If we go out under the conviction of who we are as, and we get to be ambassadors, this is wildly freeing. This is wildly hopeful. If we go out thinking that we have to do everything right, we should be crippled. So what happens when we don't? What happens in this crippling? When we see that the curtain is closed, either out of ignorance, guilt, or shame, we'll continue to try to navigate and, and atone for our sins on our own by, by manipulating some sort of checklist, or we'll realize that there's no way it can happen and we'll fall into apathy and, and we won't do anything about it. And that will either run or ruin your life. So what do we do? The invitation here is to partake of his grace. Think about, I mean, what's it like to, to walk on a, a, a good friend's heart, to come up to their door knowing that they're waiting to receive you, knowing they're waiting to open the door, and that you come in and there's light there. There's a lightness and a brightness. You can smell the bread that says, I've been waiting for you got a meal planned. Let's sit down. Let's share life together. So how do we partake with God? He's left us the scriptures. He's left us one another. So maybe it's, it's spending some more time reading his word, knowing more about God. Maybe it's spending some time writing down some, some different goals or some things about God. Or maybe it's within our relationships with one another that, that we, we begin to understand, become more aware of the presence of God. And we walk in the freedom that he affords. Psalm uh, 16, 5 and 6 talk about the boundaries that the Lord sets up and they're good. Right? And so he gives us a freedom, not that we get to do whatever we want, but that in that, but that, that by, by following who he is, that we live as we ought. So freedom is not I get to do what I want. Freedom is I do as I ought. I do as I've been created. I walk in harmony with God. I have a clear conscience because the Lord's will and my way have come into alignment with one another that I'm abiding. So as the song we sang earlier this morning about clearing out the clutter, we clear out the clutter when the Lord takes up residence within us. When he makes a highway, he comes. There's the Hebrew scriptures are filled with these languages when, when the king would come the way that like the other clean and company comes over. That's what this is alluding to. But the beauty of this here is that the king is already here and the king is helping to clear out the clutter and to change our affections so that we remain focused on him and invites us to partake. So what parts of the tabernacle stick out to you? What stands out to you about this passage? How do you begin to praise God in light of this passage? Maybe as you, as you think about different ways to write and partake, maybe it's just fake, taking some time to, to adore, just write an, an adoration. Like, why is, like, what does this show about how awesome God is? How does this shape our idea of who God is and who you are in light of Jesus' work on the cross? 
and the indwelling of the Spirit in our lives. As we think about the way that, that our thinking and that our conscience has been reshaped, how can we begin to praise the Lord for the, this reshaping? What do you think now as a result of the old way vanishing away? And what, who, and how is the Holy Spirit perfected in your conscience? What is it like to look at, at those around you and understand that, that the old way has, has vanished away in you and the old way has vanished away in them too? How does it change our relationships with one another when we, we begin to understand that they too carry with them the intrinsic value and worth and dignity of being made in the image of God and they too are worthy of honor and service? How does that change the way that we interact with, with our classmates, with our coworkers, with our friends, with our family, with our kids, with our parents, boyfriend, girlfriend, husbands, wives? What is it like when we see them as, as people in whom the Holy Spirit dwells? We're reminded that they, all the image of the tabernacle abides in them. Everything that was, was spoken about is true about them. So how will you walk with God differently this week? It's Sunday, it's 11.15. Where will you be at 11.15 on Monday? How does Hebrews 9, 1 through 10 inform what you'll be doing at 11.15 tomorrow? Who will you be around? What will you be doing? How does this inform that? What does it look like to, to partake of the divine nature in every moment? So we hear God's voice, we remember, we remind, and we rejoice. So let's remember today that God has torn down the curtain, that your conscience has been cleared. And let's rejoice Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus is a bread of life. That in that the temple of his body has risen and that we no longer need a curtain and there's no longer smoke that separates us from the Lord. And so may our affections be turned toward him as we abide with him and serve accordingly. So for you to stand with us as we sing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these good words. We thank you for your grace. Thank you that you have cleared the way.